next on Unsolved Mysteries. When Charlie Sigmund met his bride, Anne, he thought he had finally found true love. But he was wrong. Dead wrong. In 1937, Doc Noss claimed he found gold, coins, and jewels in a New Mexico mountain. Some say the $2 billion treasure might still be there. He was a well-respected judge until his clients found out he had secretly robbed them of over $10 million. Chandra Levy, Joyce Chang, both were government interns in Washington, D.C. Both were murdered. Were they the victims of a serial killer? You just might have that one vital clue to help solve one of our cases. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Join us. Brothersville, Missouri. Charlie Sigmund loved children. And when he fell in love with Anne, he also fell in love with her two boys. He wanted the best for his new family. So he sold his small house and moved Anne and her children to a nine acre farm. He called it C and A's for Charlie and Anne. They worked side by side. Those two children is what drew he and Ann together, and they were so crazy about Charlie, and he was those children. And I can look back now, I can see that she was feathering her nest, she thought. It's strange, it's something I've never been able to put my finger on, but she just didn't seem Charlie's type, ever. It was early one summer when Charlie began to suspect that there was more to Ann than met the eye. She had disappeared one night, uh, had come back, and then he woke up another night and she was gone. And she wasn't in the house. He saw a light under the door of the their refrigerator little shed they kept their vegetables and stuff in. He went out and opened the door and uh, she was sitting in the floor in a negligee, about half naked. Uh, she had a semicircle of candles around her. Had a, a poster of a Satan-like figure on the wall. Was chanting, which he didn't understand. And they had a confrontation. They went into the house, uh, and he didn't go any further than that. I didn't ask. Three weeks earlier, Charlie had found a doll in their bedroom. Anne told him that she used it in her witchcraft rituals. He said, look at that needle in through the heart that's drawn on that. And he said, I, when I woke up, when I found that, he said it was laying on my pillow. Charlie was upset. He told Ann to move out. She went to live with Gary Goff, a truck driver who had once been a policeman. Charlie had known Gary since childhood. But most upsetting to him was that Ann took her two children with her. Charlie was devastated. He missed his wife and the two boys. He still talked to Ann occasionally, but according to some friends, he had also received threatening phone calls from Ann's new boyfriend, Gary Goff. Okay, let me clean up a little bit. One night, Charlie was hanging out with an old friend at home when he got a call from Ann. She said that the two boys was crying after him. She was threatening suicide. And he said that he had to go up there and see what was happening. He said, I could be getting set up here. Are you sure you want to do this? Charlie agreed to meet Ann at Gary's house. He considered taking his handgun, but changed his mind. No.
3.20 a.m. Charlie's been shot! Charlie's been shot! Anne went to the police and told them that her husband had been shot at Gary's house. They began an investigation at the crime scene. The house was tore apart. It was been a, a very bad struggle in there. There's blood all over the door and the walls, and a couple of bullet holes in the walls, and one in the door I mentioned. And uh, there were seven bullet wounds in the body. Two guns were found. A 32 caliber revolver was lying on the floor, and a 25 caliber pistol was on top of the TV. Both had been fired. In a wastebasket in the kitchen, the police found a bloody iron. She was yelling for help. I got in there. Charlie was beating her. When questioned, Gary Goff said he fought with Charlie, hit him with the iron, and fired all seven shots at him. And confirmed his story and mentioned that she also handled the 25 caliber pistol. Did you give it to Gary, or did Gary take it from you? Um, I gave it to Gary. Ann claimed that Charlie came to the house in a drunken rage and demanded to be let in. Come on, we gotta talk. He forced his way into the house. Ann said that he began beating her until Golf came to the rescue. Although Golf had a broken arm at the time, he fought with Charlie. Then he shot him with a 32 caliber pistol five times. He fired two more shots with the 25 caliber pistol. Charlie finally collapsed. Unfortunately, no blood was taken from Charlie's body to find out if he had indeed been drinking. But if Ann and Goff had both fired at Charlie, there could be grounds for a charge of premeditated murder. Police conducted a powder residue test to see if Ann had also fired a gun. That test was inconclusive. Took it all to the prosecutor's office. He asked what I felt, and at that time, I told him I felt like it was probably self-defense, that I believed that they were telling the truth, and the only thing I could tell them was have to do more investigation and see. Ann Sigmund and Gary Goff were released, but the investigation continued. Apparently, Ann had told a friend that she had reasons for wanting Charlie dead. The sheriff's department convinced the friend to wear a wire. Perhaps Ann would say something incriminating again. Come on, come on, come on. Okay, I just need that much time. Fine. I will wait until tomorrow, and then I'll call. She, okay. uh, in talking with Miss Sigmund, had told her she was fixing to go to the police. Miss Sigmund ultimately told her not to go to the police, or asked her not to go to the police, and give her time to uh, her and uh, Mr. Goff time to leave town. She incriminated herself on the tape. Authorities prepared a warrant for Anne and Goff's arrest. But within hours, Anne had vanished, leaving her two boys behind. Gary Goff had already left town. His truck was later found abandoned in Phoenix, Arizona. In my mind, I do not see a murder first degree here. And I say that because of the scene, the disarray of the house, the damage that was done to it, the angle of the bullet wounds to the body, the fact that it occurred and the damage to Garrett, the bruises on his chest and face and the bruises on his back. And of course, the man had a broken arm. In my opinion, there's no probability of self-defense. And once we get into the trial, we can bring all the information out. I don't think that anybody else will assume that either. I would like to see him come back and resolve this thing, because I do not believe that Gary Goff is capable of murder first degree. Both Davis and Hilburn believe that this case will not be resolved until Ann Sigmund and Gary Goff have their day in court. Update. Gary Goff turned himself in and pled guilty to second degree murder. Goff was sentenced to 20 years and was released after serving 13 years and five months. From prison, he begged Sigmund to turn herself in but she refused. There is still an outstanding warrant for the arrest of Ann Sigmund for first degree murder. She may be living in Oregon or Arizona under the alias Andy Hayes or Andy Partlow. 
If you have any information, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Coming up, interns working for two different congressmen are murdered. The similarities between the cases suggest there is a connection. Washington, D.C. The disappearance of Capitol Hill intern Chandra Levy caught the attention of the entire country. Thirteen months after Chandra vanished, police were called to a remote section of Rock Creek Park, four miles from her apartment. A hiker's dog had uncovered a human skull halfway down a wooded incline far away from the well-used paths. In the dense brush, Police also found additional bones, a jogger's bra, and a cassette player. The search for Chandra Levy was over. Her death was ruled a homicide, but what exactly happened to Chandra remains a mystery. Few people know that another Washington intern, Joyce Chang, disappeared two years before Chandra. Although there was no national media coverage, the similarities between the two cases are disturbing. The two women lived in the same neighborhood and had worked for the same government agency. They were both young, brunette and petite. Could there be a connection between the murders of Joyce and Chandra? When Chandra Levy disappeared, it certainly brought back a lot of memories. And we wondered if there was a connection that question remains open, and the question of Joyce's disappearance remains open. I strongly believe that these particular incidents involving these two women may have been committed by the, the same perpetrator, simply because of the, there's just too many similarities in this, in this case to, to ignore. Joyce was the only daughter in a close-knit Taiwanese-American family. While in college, she was an intern for Representative Howard Berman of California. She had a wonderful personality. She was just very cheerful. She'd light up a room, that kind of a person. I mean, she was just adorable. After her internship, Joyce took a job as a lawyer at the INS. She lived with her brother Roger in the DuPont Circle area of Washington. Chandra would later move to the same neighborhood. A favorite hangout for both was the nearby Starbucks. It was here that Joyce was last seen. I don't know about you guys, but I ate way too much. <laughs> Earlier that evening, Joyce met up with some friends to see a movie and eat dinner. Bye. At about 8.15, my sister was with uh, her friend Kathy. Joyce asked to make one quick stop at the Starbucks uh, to grab a cup of tea. Joyce told her friend that she was going to walk home. She never made it back to her apartment. When Joyce failed to return home, her brother called the police. I like to report a missing person. Because Joyce was a federal employee, the FBI became involved. It's spelled C-H-I. At first, the investigation turned up nothing. Then a couple came forward with the first clue in the case. Joyce disappeared on January 9th. Uh, on January 10th, a couple was walking through Anacostia Park and had found a billfold with Joyce's government credit card and had turned that into the park police. But the credit card remained in Lost and Found for four days until the couple saw Joyce's picture in a news broadcast. They contacted the FBI. A 57-member search and rescue team combed the area where the card was found. They discovered Joyce's apartment keys, her video and grocery store cards, her gloves, Got a jacket over here. and the jacket she had been wearing. There was a clean rip running down the back of it. Her coat torn down the back, her cards scattered every place. We're just terrified. We know she's dead. You know, you don't want to confront it, but you know something horrible has happened to her. The police searched the river, but found nothing. 
Then, three months later and eight miles downstream, a canoe has spotted a body that had washed the shore. After three months underwater, DNA tests were needed to identify the body. It was Joyce Chang. That's when all hope just dashed that, um, that Joyce was alive. And I quickly called my mother. One of the most difficult phone calls I've ever had to make to tell my mother that her daughter was dead. And that's a moment that I'll never forget. The condition of her body made it impossible to determine how Joyce died. The cause of death was listed as undetermined. Without evidence of foul play, investigators felt there was nothing more to be done. The case was closed. Then two years later, Chandra Levy was murdered. The similarities between the two women were chilling. However, police dismissed them. For the first time, they suggested that Joyce may have committed suicide. This is a woman without a history of depression. This is a woman who worked very hard in life and had everything to live for, and, the only, and it's just not a theory that makes sense. If Joyce did commit suicide, why was her jacket ripped? Why were her belongings left on the bank of the river? And how did she get to the riverbank almost five miles from where she was last seen? She didn't have a car, and no public transportation goes there. And on a extremely freezing cold day in January, commit suicide by wading into the Anacostia River and putting her head under the water. That is patently absurd on its face. There is another clue that adds to the mystery surrounding Joyce Chang. Just three days after she was last seen at the coffee shop, a bizarre message appeared on a nearby wall. It read, Good day, JC. May I never miss the thrill of being near you. Just the initials JC, which are the same initials as my sister's name, and the content of the message, may I never miss the thrill of being near you, it was all just a little too weird, a little peculiar. If a serial killer is responsible for these murders, there are those who believe that he has taken not two, but three lives. Five months before Joyce disappeared, 28-year-old Christine Merzion was raped and murdered while she was walking home from a barbecue. She had been an intern, and she fit the same description. All three women lived in the DuPont area. All three women had dark hair. All three women were about the same height, and uh, they were all here uh, as interns at one point in their careers. There were no similarities in those three cases, period. That case is currently in a closed status. If somebody knows something, then maybe they'll see this and realize that there are still people who care and still want to know what happened to her, and maybe they will come forward and, and tell us. We haven't completely gone on with our lives and forgotten about Joyce. Update. There are new developments in this case. Here's one of our staff with details. The investigations into the murders of Chandra Levy and Joyce Chang have been closed, and it turns out they were unrelated. Assisted by a tip from a jailhouse informant, police charged a 27-year-old illegal immigrant, Ingmar Guandique, with Chandra's murder. Based substantially on his cellmate's testimony, Guandique was convicted and sentenced to 60 years. However, in an unexpected twist, federal prosecutors reversed course, saying they can no longer prove a case against Ingmar Guandique because of, quote, recent unforeseen developments, end quote. It has been alleged that recordings of the jailhouse informant demonstrate that he had lied, leaving prosecutors unable to prove Guandique guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Guandique will be released to U.S. immigration where he faces deportation proceedings. In the case of Joyce Chang, the case was closed because police have identified her killers as two D.C. area males who abducted Joyce and took her to the Anacostia River where they intended to rob her. 
Police believe that Joyce attempted to run from her captors, but slipped on the ice, fell into the river, and drowned. One of the two men is currently in federal prison serving a life sentence. The other is believed to be in Guyana, which has no extradition treaty with the United States. Next, some believe that there is a treasure buried in New Mexico's Victoria Peak worth nearly $2 billion. But Uncle Sam won't allow anyone to look for it. White Sands, New Mexico. 100,000 acres of desert. Home only to rattlesnakes and sagebrush, vultures and mule deer. In 1937, a man named Doc Nas was deer hunting here. He hiked to the top of a hill known as Victorio Peak. As thirst and fatigue set in, he looked for water from one of the mountain's many springs. Instead, he discovered a mysterious hole in the ground, the hidden entrance to a tunnel. There was a ladder in the opening, and Doc climbed inside. A maze of tunnels led to a large cavern. He found an old chest. On it, an old English inscription that read, Sealed Silver. The chest was only a small part of the treasure that Doc Knotts claimed that he found. Buried deep, deep in that cavern was gold, silver, jewels, and gold bars that today would be worth $1.7 billion. It's a lot of money. Doc Knotts first made a living as a traveling medicine showman. Then he married Ova Beckwith, nicknamed Babe, and opened a foot clinic in Hot Springs, New Mexico. Doc was my grandfather, and I've heard incredible stories about him all of my life. He loved adventure and um, was fascinated with history. There it is. Yeah. After Doc discovered the treasure at Victoria Peak, he and Babe spent every free moment exploring the tunnels that led deep, deep inside the mountain. Careful, Doc yeah, found that down. the passageways in the mountain led to several caverns. In one, he found 79 human skeletons. In another, jewels, coins, and priceless artifacts. He described uh, uh, three huge uh, oval top chests that he opened. He brought a couple of swords and knives out. He brought out a crown, and I cleaned it up in my sink in, in town. It was 243 diamonds and one pigeon blood ruby in this crown. In a deeper cavern, Doc stumbled across what looked like a stack of worthless iron bars. Here it is, babe. I said, well, Doc, this is yellow. Look at it. And he looked at that, and he said, well, babe, if that's gold, and all that other is gold like it, we can call John D. Rockefeller a tramp. Doc told babe there were as many as 16,000 bars of gold in the cavern. But how did the treasure get there? There are four theories. It could have belonged to Juan de Oñate, the man who founded New Mexico as a Spanish colony. Some believe it was a secret hiding place for a Catholic missionary who operated nearby gold mines. It could have belonged to Maximilian, the emperor of Mexico who tried to remove wealth out of Mexico when he learned of an assassination plot. Finally, it may have belonged to an Apache tribe that raided stagecoaches filled with gold mined in California. Doc didn't really care where it came from. Six months after his discovery, he and Babe went to Santa Fe to establish legal ownership of their claim. Could I help you, sir? Yeah, we need some information on filing a claim. They filed a lease 
with the state of New Mexico for the entire section of land surrounding Victoria Peak. They then filed a treasure trove claim, which has become the historic Noss family claim to the treasure in Victoria Peak. For two years, Doc mined the peak. Witnesses say he took out more than 200 gold bars and then hid them from everyone, even his family. Back then, it was illegal to own gold that wasn't in the form of jewelry. They were rehidden in a variety of locations all over the desert, some uh, right by the county roads by uh, a certain marked telephone pole. Some were dropped in horse tanks at the nearby ranches. Some were just buried in the sand, um, and Doc would put a different colored rock over the top of it uh, than was natural to that surrounding. Finally, Doc decided to try opening a larger passageway into Victoria Peak. So he hired a mining engineer by the name of Montgomery to go with him and help him dynamite out of the way a particularly huge boulder that was just sort of hanging in the lower portion of the shaft. Doc and uh, Montgomery was arguing very viciously about the charge to be put in there. Doc said that the mountain was rotten and that it wouldn't take a charge like that. And this Montgomery kept yelling it would. By the way, he got eight bars for doing it. The blast caused a massive cave-in that collapsed the shaft. Doc had shut himself out of his own mind forever. Now, instead of having thousands of gold bars to draw from, he only had those few dozen or hundred or so that he'd brought to the surface, and he became very protective of those bars. For nine years, Doc tried to sell his gold bars on the black market. And then he met a man named Charlie Ryan and struck a deal to sell him 51 of the bars. It took me a couple days to get my cash together, but uh, how about a week from today? Later, Doc worried that Charlie Ryan would double cross him. At the last minute, Doc asked his friend Tony Jolly to help him move the gold to a new hiding place. We went out across the desert, quite a long ways, and we started digging, and we dug 20 bars of gold out of the ground right there. It turned out to be 90 more, and we reburied those bars of gold. I handled and I saw 110 bars of gold. The next day, Doc and Ryan got into an argument. Ryan pulled a gun on Doc. Ryan accosted him and said, if you don't tell me where the bars are, you won't leave this room alive. You're just trying to jack up the price on me. He's just a convent, Charlie! He's going for as good as it is dropped! Shoot him! Shoot him! Shoot him! Shoot him! Shoot him! Shoot him! Old Doc died instantly. This photograph of the scene was taken by police. The saga of the treasure at Victoria Peak did not die with Doc Noss. As the legend grew, other treasure hunters tried to cash in on Doc and Babe's claim. Next, meet a man who says that he's actually seen the gold that was hidden inside Victoria Peak. Victoria Peak, New Mexico. When Doc Knotts was killed in 1949, he supposedly left behind a treasure of 15,000 gold bars buried inside the caverns of Victoria Peak. For three years, Doc's wife, Babe, tried to clear a passageway to the treasure. She was less than 12 yards from the opening to the central cavern when disappointment struck again. When the White Sands Missile Range was expanded, the state of New Mexico was forced to give Victoria Peak and the land surrounding it to the United States Army. What are y'all doing on our claim? The Army then forced Babe Noss and her family 
off of their claim. My grandmother continued to petition the Department of the Army at White Sands Missile Range level and Pentagon level. She was repeatedly, continually, and consistently denied access to the peak. Victoria Peak was now off limits to everyone by order of the military. However, that didn't stop a group of off-duty soldiers from clearing the blocked entrance and exploring the caverns. It wasn't long before they found what Babe Noss oh, was after. What is it? Two stacks of material, and they were bars of something. And as we scratched it, we knew right away that it was actually gold. We marked and identified one of the bricks inside with my initials on it, and we stood it on end on the large piles. When the soldiers left Victoria Peak, they did not take any of the treasure with them. We were in the middle of a top secret missile range that was forbidden to everybody to be in. The last thing in the world we wanted to do was to jeopardize our position and our find by removing something prematurely. The following weekend, we returned to the entrance and we dynamited it in four different places and blasted the whole thing shut. The Army began a top secret classified operation at Victoria Peak. They petitioned the state of New Mexico for mineral rights, but the request was denied. Even so, aerial surveillance photos shows that extensive work had already taken place. Finally, the Army succumbed to pressure and allowed private claimants, including Babe Noss and former military personnel, to undertake a highly publicized 10-day expedition at Victoria Peak. It's sort of the Department of Army policy that there's been a lot of searching up here and we found nothing yet. They found nothing yet, so I don't really expect any particular gold treasure to be found, but I might be quoted incorrectly too if they find something. There's no question that gold like bars came out of this mount. No question about it. The excavation was an extensive large scale operation. But after ten days, no treasure, not a single silver coin had been found. One scientist who worked on the dig thinks the treasure may have actually been there, but just out of their reach. I noticed on the radar screen some uh, echoes quite frequently at a very great depth, 300, 400 feet deep. And that led me to the conclusion that there was indeed a large cavern at the base of the mountain, about where Doc Noss had said there would, was a cavern. Deep in the heart of Victoria Peak, there may still be jewels, artifacts, and piles of gold worth a billion dollars. Tony Jolly, the man who helped hide some of the gold, went back years later and retrieved 10 bars. But Doc's heirs have recovered nothing. For them, the fate of the treasure is still literally a billion dollar question. And we have decided that we will finish the work that Doc Noss started. We will eventually get Victoria Peak open so that the mystery of what's inside the peak can be solved. If the mountain has not been penetrated and materials removed from this mountain, this will be the biggest thing that this country's ever seen. Next, when citizens of Newport, New Hampshire needed financial advice, they turned to Judge Fairbanks. Huge mistake. Newport, New Hampshire. A small town where everyone knows each other and where relationships are based on honesty and trust. Judge John Fairbanks was a lifelong resident. On a quiet morning in May, he asked his clerk to find a replacement for him, and then he left town. John Fairbanks was both a respected judge and a successful attorney. So when he resigned from the bench and abandoned his law practice, people were shocked. But a few days later, their shock 
turned to outrage when they discovered the judge had stolen more than $10 million from his friends and neighbors. Do you understand that you have a right to present evidence on your behalf? For 33 years, Judge Fairbanks presided over the District Court of Newport. I'll get to that later. He also had a successful law practice specializing in wills and probate law. John was a nice guy. Everybody in the community liked him. Uh, nobody had a bad word for him. He just loved his family. Uh, I loved his children, his grandchildren. Uh, just a great guy. Fairbanks was honest. I mean, that was his reputation. You might knock him for other things, but the one thing everybody ever always said about John Fairbanks was he was honest. When a client died, Judge Fairbanks would visit his widow to help her out with her financial planning. Nice of you to see. John Fairbanks was settling my uncle's estate. And then, of course, I had the estate and I had income tax to do. And I knew him, so I went back to him for the income taxes. And I went to him every year for doing my income tax. Patricia Sawyer gave her stock certificates to Fairbanks so that he could help inventory her holdings. He called me on the phone and asked about my getting, could I get the stocks that day? Judge Fairbanks and I had talked about doing an estate plan and changing my will. Is this everything, Patricia? This is everything. You're sure? Yes. October the 12th, Black Monday on Wall Street. The drop in the stock market was felt worldwide, including Judge Fairbanks' courtroom. Take a brief recess. All rise, please. The stock market crash I remember very, very well. It was the judge's 65th birthday. He made a couple comments about turning 65 is just wonderful. The stock market crashes on your 65th birthday. He said if he panicked, Hello, Ed. that he would lose over $3 million in the crash, but that he wasn't going to panic. John, when am I going to be getting some dividends? Oh, we'll be getting it the soon. effects of the crash oh, soon trickled down to Patricia. I asked him why I wasn't getting dividend checks, and he said that due to the stock market crash, my stocks had gone down, and he was turning the dividends back in to bring the stocks up to where they were before the crash, before the, the drop in the stock market. And I believed that. I called Fairbanks in the spring of 88 because I had not been receiving accountings, and it was at that time that he told me that uh, he had been spending my brother's principal. John Tweedy had hired Fairbanks to be the legal guardian for his brother, Richard, who had been institutionalized for more than 40 years. John insisted that Fairbanks meet him face to face to discuss concerns about his brother's holdings. John, how are you? How are you, John? Good well, to like you. you wanted, I brought the account. I had certain questions to ask him about the estate. I mean, there was rhetoric in his response, but he didn't answer the questions. When did my brother's estate go into the red? Well, John, I haven't got all those figures up here in my head, but you come back to my office later in the week and I'll lay it all out for you. Well, I sure will. It was at that time I found out that 75% uh, of my brother's money was gone. Why didn't you inform me when his estate went into the red? Well, John, I tried to, but you're a hard man to find. John refused to accept the judge's excuses and began his own investigation. I found that he had sold stock and he had underreported what he'd gotten for the stock. Uh, he had underreported what he'd gotten for dividends. So I came up with $20,000 that was missing. Turned out that was only a part of what was missing. But, and it was at that point I realized that, uh, well, he was embezzling. And uh, I've been raised to believe that when you see a crime committed, you call the cops. And so I uh, called the cops. We drove over to look at Fairbanks' house here in Newport. And uh, we saw the house, and we felt, gee, that's got to be $500,000. We were aware that he had a home in Agunquit, Maine, which is a pretty expensive area to live, right on the ocean, that was worth six or $700,000. And we looked at each other and said, this guy's a thief. Fairbanks resigned his judgeship and retreated to his summer home in Maine. When John Tweedy's charges were made public, 
other unhappy clients came forward with their suspicions. He put these stocks into this stock brokerage firm as my agent, and I had never signed any papers, given him any authority. I had never signed my name on the certificates. He had done that illegally. Fairbanks had, in my opinion, had been doing this for so long that he had sort of milked dry most of the accounts that he had been stealing from. Authorities suspect that over the course of 20 years, Fairbanks stole more than $10 million. Judge Fairbanks was indicted on four counts of theft. The investigation revealed that Fairbanks wrote more than 100 checks to transfer money from his client's accounts into his own account. The next day, Fairbanks' pickup truck was found abandoned near his home in Maine. The judge had disappeared. This has affected my life to the fact that I wonder what I'm going to do, and I'm going to have to sell land, maybe sell the farm. And the farm has been in my family since the original settlers came from Massachusetts at the Rocksteams. He had a double life. He had two, two totally separated lives. And uh, one of them was fine. You know, one of them was a, a man of uh, great integrity, uh, respected by the community, and the other, uh, <laughs> The other one was, well, classical. You know, he was into all sorts of things which are very shaky, very shady, and quite immoral. And very few, if anybody, knew the two existed. Update. Five years after his disappearance, Judge John Fairbanks was found dead in a Las Vegas hotel room. He committed suicide. Authorities do not expect to locate any of the money that he stole. They believe he spent it all before he died.